Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. But the We changed the name. Find today. Uh, oh my gosh. Where's Chairman Paisley? I like your answer. I second worth the five hundred dollars I take. Yeah. It is. Merry and, Christmas. And, Call this meeting to order. <laughs> and I understand Mr. Carter's already indicated I was the late John Paisley. <laughs> uh, okay. Mr. Carter. You have the honors. I do, don't I? Join me in a word of prayer. Father God, as we gather, to he gather here this morning, dear Lord, in your sight, in your presence, dear Lord, we ask you to watch over and keep us, give us wisdom, knowledge, and courage to do what you would have us do for the people of our co community, of our county. We ask, dear Lord, that you keep us safe as we go through the day, protect our law enforcement, our EMTs, our firemen, our everybody that serves you, dear Lord. Protect our people. We ask, Father God, that you uh, watch over these deliberations, and that you bless us as we've been mightily blessed in the past. We ask all this, dear Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Throw me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First thing on our agenda is our organization of this board. Um, I have had the honor of serving as the chairman and Mr. Carter's vice chairman up until now for this particular year. Uh, do we have a motion to elect a chair? Yes, chairman, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to make uh, John Paisley chairman. I'll second that. Thank you, sir. Any discussion? Thank goodness. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. We now need a motion for vice chair. Well, I'll make that motion. Okay. <laughs> Steve Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? There being none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. 
on all counts. You want to say thank you? I already did. Okay. <laughs> okay, at this point, we have the honor of asking the Honorable Terry Johnson to come forward for a presentation. for me to read the citation for these Please. officers. Yes. At this time, we would like to uh, recognize the actions of deputies Leon Statton and Shane Adams. And I will read the uh, citation. The Alamance County Sheriff's Office requested the Board of Commissioners present two life-saving awards to deputies Leon Statton and Shane Adams. The summaries of the events of their citation are as follows. On October 19, 2021, the Sheriff's Office received a call from Deputy Chief Lewis from the Pleasant Grove Fire Department, who recommended Corporal Leon Statton and Deputy Shane Adams receive life-saving awards. Earlier that day, the Sheriff's Office was dispatched for a well-being check. The victim had a stroke and had fallen to the floor. Before suffering from the stroke, the victim had been cooking and food was burning on the stove. Once the deputies arrived, Corporal Statton spotted the victim on the floor and forced entry into the home. Deputy Adams located the source of the heat and turned off the stove while Corporal Statton rendered aid to the victim. Deputy Chief Lewis stated that the likelihood of a fire was imminent if entry had not been made and the stove not turned off. Congratulations, deputies, and thank you for your service. what makes serving as chairman worthwhile. <laughs> well, I've known Leon for a long time. If somebody can break down a door, he can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, chair, if I if I may, um, we need to do the review of the bonds of public officials before you go on to anything else. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And again, thank goodness for this lady over here. <laughs> okay. Um, you have reviewed in your packet the bonds that need to be issued. Do we have a motion? Motion was approved. Uh, so moved. Uh, second. <laughs> you have a motion, have a second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. I'm seeing there are no public speakers. I uh, would hope there are no county commissioner responses in review of new speakers. <laughs> okay, we are now moving uh, to the agenda. Uh, is there a motion for the approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. I'll second. All 
right. Motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Unanimous. Okay, the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, something pretty simple for you all from my department. Um, what we're looking for is to set a public hearing for December 20th for a historic marker for West Grove Friends Church Meeting House in the cemetery there. Um, this is part of the ordinance for Historic Property Commission to have a public hearing when we're considering a uh, historic marker. This is part of that process when an applicant pr presents to staff. We send that information to the state. State does a review at the Historic Preservation Office, gives their blessing, and then they send it back to Historic Property. They've also um, given consent to this, so you are the final decision-making board for that. Board, any questions? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, Ms. Motley. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I'm Ashley Motley, Coordinator of Health Services. My primary responsibility is to provide program management and oversight to the maintenance of effort funds and mental health and substance abuse initiatives. Thank you for the opportunity to present. The data I will cover today includes January through September 2019 through 2021. If the board would like, I can return in February to give a full calendar year overview. <clears throat> the maintenance of effort contract funds $1,085,000 to RHA for crisis diversion services. RHA is currently located at 3732 Anne Elizabeth Drive in Burlington and operates 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Sunday. RHA Crisis Diversion Center serves adults and children in Alamance County who are experiencing behavioral health crisis and individuals involved with law enforcement who present with mental health symptoms, including involuntary commitment initial assessments. RHA services cover a range of evaluation and treatment services, including triage, evaluation, stabilization, psychiatric medication management, outpatient group therapy, and comp comprehensive mental health and substance use services. In 2019, RHA saw 379 crisis clients. In 2020, 512 clients. This increase is most likely due to RHA's expansion of hours to cover weekends, which began in July of 2020. In 2021, 524 crisis clients were seen. During the three-year time period, between 22 and 33% of crisis clients were sent to the emergency department from RHA due to closing hour, closing hours, psychiatric acuity, medical emergency, need for medical clearance, or center capacity. The majority of these referrals could have been served in a 24-7, 365 facility-based crisis diversion center. The majority of crisis clients arrived and departed from RHA voluntarily. 12 to 14 percent arrived involuntarily and 23 to 29 departed involuntarily. Less than 2 percent left by emergency custody. Sixty to sixty-five percent of clients leave RHA with arrangements for outpatient community mental health, developmental disability, or substance abuse services and supports. These services are provided by RHA or other community providers. Three to thirty percent of clients are connected with community inpatient psychiatric services. The twenty-seven percent percent gap is due to services availability and having beds available. From 2019 to 2021, there were a significant decrease in the number of clients being transferred from RHA to the hospital emergency department. Male and female crisis clients were about 50-50 across all three years, with adults 
accounting for 70 to 75 percent of the crisis clients and ch children 25 to 30 percent. 23 to 34% of the clients presented with a co-occurring diagnosis. That is the presence of a mental health disorder and a drug or substance disorder. The National Survey of Drug Use and Health stated that 45% of Americans suffer from a dual or co-occurring diagnosis. 62 to 71% of RHA clients suffered from a mental health disability with 2 to 5% from substance abuse disability and less than 1% from intellectual disabilities. 92 to 97 percent of crisis clients seen reside in Alamance County. However, all clients served by the diversion, Crisis Diversion Center were in Alamance County when their crisis occurred. <clears throat> 28 to 43 percent of clients were covered by Medicaid, with 16 to 32 percent of those clients covered by commercial insurance, and 27 to 35 percent indigent state funded. In fiscal year 2021, RHA's revenue totaled $151,980,000, which funds the weekend hours of operation. RHA Crisis Diversion Center reserves client, serves client, receives clients through a variety of referrals, with the largest referrals coming from law enforcement. Law enforcement drop-off has almost doubled from 2019 to 2021, making up, up for 33 to 44% of referrals. Self-referral or referral by family or friends accounts for 24 to 30% of referrals. These referrals are critical and why marketing and advertising are very beneficial. <coughs> Medical or mental health community provider referrals were 23 to 25%, and other organizations such as the Department of Social Services, jail, detention, or prison facility, and schools account for the six to 14% of referrals. RHA currently averages 30 law enforcement drop-offs per month with an average of six-minute drop-off times. Lastly, Commissioners, I am eager to participate in ongoing collaboration efforts to develop and implement crisis diversion services for Alamance County. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I just have a couple. Okay. Um, actually, when you said that they leave, they've gone through the process and the assessment and all that at RHA on site, where do they go? What are some of the places that you can say, because uh, we don't have a whole lot of places here in Alamance County, so where are you seeing these folks going to? Okay. Uh, I'm going to refer to Sarah um, with RHA or Amy to answer the question. Good morning. So um, RHA does connect with other providers in Alamance County that also provide community services, right? So if there is a need for detox, right, we connect them to a detox center. If there is a need for outpatient services, right, to see a therapist and a psychiatrist, our job is to connect with those providers in the community that do that work. While RHA provides those services as well, we are, um, one of our core beliefs is provider choice, right? Where does that individual want to go? What works with their schedule? Um, to make sure that we find the right fit. When you say detox, what are some of the places in Alamance County? Sure, so Residential Treatment Services of Alamance County is a, a detox center that provides that service. We also have a partnership with Freedom House in Chapel Hill that also um, can provide that services. We try to keep people in the community, right? So we want them to go here first, um, but if the beds are full or um, they're not able to take that person, we, we go to the secondary choices. Okay, and um, whenever law enforcement drops someone off at RHA, does law enforcement have to stay there like they would the emergency room? No, they do not, right? So our turnaround for law enforcement drop-offs right now is six minutes for officers. Um, we have the pleasure of partnering with the Alamance County Sheriff's Department and we have a deputy on site who can take custody of individuals so that um, officers who are on patrol can go back um, on patrol. And that has worked out very well. Okay. Your school numbers seemed really low to me. Yeah. Just being on the school board for eight years and really know the insides and outs, especially after children have been home isolated due to COVID. Yeah. And we just saw a nightmare of a school shooting that I think COVID doesn't do anything, but the effects of COVID can really play heavy on young people as far as any agitated truth. Um, 
how is that relationship going with the school system as far as who is your contact person that how does that ball start rolling? So we have a great relationship with the school. The data might not be correct. So sometimes the school will call law enforcement on site and they take it over from there. If that law enforcement brings that child to our center, it's a law enforcement contact, right? So it may be a double dipping, right? School and law enforcement, but we take it from who brings them in, which is usually law enforcement or SROs who also go in that law enforcement category. Like if there's a psychotropic break at a school, mm -hmm. if I've been part of something like that at a school once a young, young man, just, it was just really sad. How, how does that work? Because there's an SRO there to start with. Yeah. And school officials. Yeah. So we have a great relationship with the school, right? They'll call us, hey, can we bring this person over here? We meet with them monthly to make sure that we're meeting their needs um, from a school system perspective and keeping their, um, when children are in crisis, that we're being available, right? We also connect them to other resources in the community like Mobile Crisis, right? Who can come on site to the school. Um, so we help kind of coordinate some of that work with the school system. Well, I know, and I, I brought RTSA up, and I'm not picking on them, they do amazing work, but they are only one facility. They cannot take everybody, and you don't take somebody for a week. It's a long term because this is so much work to, to help a person with. And um, we've got, I know Freedom House, we've got some clients at Freedom House right now. I'm just curious as to our county, if we will ever really look at this in a very serious way as to have our own Freedom House, our own type of situation that we can have here to really care for our young and our adults because um, the further away, the further and harder it is for a family support system to kind of come through that when there's group therapy that starts working into these issues. So that's, that's just a plant, a big construction type seed. To, a fo to follow up on that, I've had, uh, and I don't do criminal law any, any longer, thank goodness, but uh, when I did, oftentimes it was better for the um, defendant, for call them what, the, the patient or whatever you want to call them, to get them out of the area, to get, get them away from the influences that are in this environment that they were growing up in and get them uh, removed which is a better idea or are both good ideas? Um, I think what we try to do is um, usually when someone's in a mental health crisis, our job is to de-escalate and then start the path to recovery, right? So um, connecting to housing resources if they want to relocate, right? Um, that's an option. But I think some of the ongoing treatment is exactly what you're talking about, right? How do they start to determine, am I living in the right place? Do I have other resources where I could relocate that's a better situation for me, right? And that goes along with the, the long-term treatment and, and how we meet the person where they're at. So your facility, RHA, will help make that determination and then determine whether they're better off in a different environment or this environment? It, it's really the person's <clears throat> choice, right? But we're there to assist them in um, um, determining what the best choice for them is and connecting them to the resources for that choice. Absolutely. All right, currently what hours and how many days of the week are you open? Yeah, so we are open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and that changed in July of 2020. RHA recognized that the community was um, and the hospital system was being overwhelmed with COVID um, increases. And so we partnered with Cardinal Innovations at the time um, in order to gain some more funding to expand those additional 24 hours. And who are you partnering with currently? Um, Cardinal Innovations. And then January 1st, we will move over to VIA Healthcare. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're working to extend those hours some more, um, Sarah? We are. So the county has received a grant um, to expand hours further, and we are. Um, one signature away from doing that before we announce. All right, law enforcement drops them one off or would attempt to drop them off at your location and it's outside of these hours. What happens? Um, right now, currently, they um, utilize the emergency room. All right, so it's either the emergency room. What happens? It's not a six minute drop off at the emergency room, is it? Yeah, it is not. Um, I don't have the current data, but we have heard from our um, law enforcement partners that that wait is a lot longer right now. 
like maybe hours or 12 hours possibly, 10 hours. Or longer, yeah. Yeah. So if you expand your facility, would that be beneficial to the community? Absolutely. I think this facility, um, with you all's um, support, has really um, provided Alamance County something that not all counties have, right? Um, we've decreased, you know, law enforcement having to take people to the ED and to the jails. And so I think, um, you know, that has been going well for the last 11 years. And we continue to learn, right? We continue to learn how to meet the needs of law enforcement as well as <coughs> Alamance County citizens so that we can better our practice. All right. So if hypothetically, Mr. Jones, I'm not sure who Mr. Jones is, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's picked up on a Saturday afternoon. Where do they go? Um, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., they would go to RHA. All right. After these hours? Um, the emergency room would be the only option for them. And from there? Uh, After the emergency room, where would they go? I'm not sure. Um, likely, well, well, likely the Alamance County Jail? Possibly, right? Yeah. I think every situation is different, right? Um, back out to the streets, um, you know, I think our goal is to tie them with support so that when they leave that crisis situation that they don't come back, right? Law enforcement's not getting called back out. Um, repeatedly. So you're advocating for possibly a full-time facility? Yes. Why would that benefit the community? Um, again, right, the support for law enforcement, right, they are the first responders to most mental health calls because people call 911, right? We need a center that will allow them to drop off, right, give a quick report and then go back out to where, you know, they need to be. So, you know, um, supporting Alamance County um, and the safety of Alamance County. And are you currently working with VIA and with the county commissioners to uh, expand that facility? Yes. All right. what, are, what are those plans? What, um, what are you hoping for? We have been asked to provide a budget and um, what it would look like for a 24-7 crisis center, um, an outpatient center, right? in a 16-bed um, facility-based crisis and detox center in one location, right? So what that does is, you know, Sarah goes into a crisis, I have a bed where I can stabilize for three to five days, and then my therapist or a peer support worker is there to connect with me before I leave, which will engage treatment and recovery for individuals. And then determine the best fit for that particular uh, Absolutely. patient. Absolutely, right. So that planning, wrapping services around an individual um, so that they go home with not only a person who's working with them, um, a support system, but also a plan. All right. Um, any idea how soon that'll happen? That's up, up to this board, isn't it? Well, and I think uh, <laughs> we've been working on the grant funding to take the hours to, I believe, midnight. Uh, where, where the RHA is currently closing at 8 p.m. The grant that the county secured through the Bureau of Justice Assistance would take those hours till midnight. I think last I had understood we might be looking at that being able to start 1st of January perhaps and we have Gary and Linda here with us too that have been working actively on securing those grants and administering them. So uh, hopefully by the first of the year RHA will be able to expand its hours till midnight each night. It will be a big help for families in crisis and for law enforcement too. Yep. Not as good as 24 hours, but better than where we came from a couple years ago. We were, uh, I don't remember where the hours were originally, but it's uh, maybe 8 to 5 or 8 to 8. Were eight the to eight, Monday through Friday. Yeah. Yep. So we've gone from 8 to 8, Monday through Friday, to 7 days a week, 8 to 8, preparing to go 7 days a week, uh, 8 a.m. to 12 midnight. I have another question, John, because I'll forget if I don't ask it. Um, one question. We have Linda and Gary that represent one thing, and they're on site in the jail. You have RHA on site in the jail. Do you guys combine all of your information? Like are you, like one team, so to speak, just different players? Uh, data, Do are they privileged to your data to see, not names, I know we don't want names, but I mean, are they privileged to your data to see who's being served, where they're being served, what their situation is, so to speak? 
because with that data, I would think that could lead to possible funding, evidence-based situations for the county. I'm just curious as to how you guys work as a team. Mm -hmm. So currently under our um, contract, we report quarterly data, right, which is um, some of the stuff that you saw today. Mm -hmm. We report that to the health department um, under our contract, and I, I, I believe that information is shared, but I'm not sure. And that's part, Commissioner, that's part of Ashley's role. We're very glad to have her on board. She is a health department employee, and her role is to help us digest this data and to make sure the county's spending its maintenance of effort funding in a way that impacts our community. Um, so it's uh, very helpful to have her collating this, packaging it. She'll be presenting it to the commissioners going forward and also to Jack. So uh, we're glad to have her, uh, and it'll be very helpful to all of us to, to get, uh, get this data kind of packaged for us. So. I'd just like to ask you a question, Ashley, because mm -hmm. you're on the front lines of this, so to speak. Um, what is something that our county can do better for this besides build the building? Um, from my perspective? Yeah, totally, because we um, have got depth in this. this I, would, I would say, um, from my perspective, it would be the community collaboration um, to really look at all that are providing services for those who are struggling with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and to really put those that we aim to serve first. What are their needs? Um, how are we, where are we not capturing them? You know, how are they going underdetected? Um, really taking a look at the lives that we're losing um, and how do we really um, build a facility that will help to lower those numbers. Exactly, this is the client that we focus on. I don't know if we've done this, maybe this has been before me coming on the Commissioner Board, but I know that when Patsy Simpson and I were pushing some of our for mental health services on site within our school buildings, we had meetings, they were called summits, this is like Mans County, but we had a summit, um, and it brought all these providers into the same room, and a lot of these providers didn't even know the other, which meant they were duplicating a lot of services, which means they were all trying to do everything, which can make you spread really thin. So I didn't know if this, this group, this, this county, had had that situation with providers because I, I know RTSA is not the only one, but we need to know who else is someone helping to spread this around so people are not told we can't see you for months, we don't have any openings or sure come on in. Because the goal is to ASAP. This is 911 business. It's too slow to tell you the truth, 911. But um, this is something that we have. Um, it's not just about building a building, and I, I can't say that enough because the money doesn't scare me about building a building. It's what's in this building and what's going to happen in this building, and this is not a two to three thing. Oh, it didn't turn out too good. You know, we're not going to be like a Belks or Sears at the mall and then they move up the street. That just puts you in a sinkhole. So um, I would like to know if this county has done something like that, and if not, can we do something? Because there is power in unity when it comes to working together, and it can take the load off of one sole agency that, I, I'm not beating up, but I think that's the only one I'm knowing of, and I know they cannot do it all, and that's why. That's I'm a really interesting that. idea, uh, Commissioner Thompson, and I'm not aware if we, uh, I see Jerry, maybe you could speak to the, the, like a group meeting of providers. So out of our 2019 SIMS exercise, mm -hmm. the sequential intercept mapping, um, which is a part of the, the stepping up initiative where we kind of look at what's going on in the community. You know, we had five priorities that came out of that, um, and that was attended by uh, leaders in the, in the community um, and went, went up for a day and a half. But the, the first priority was to establish a 24-7 diversion center, which has been our top priority for the last five and a half years. The second was, though, was to increase collaboration and communication between the crisis providers in Alamance County. So that's primarily ARMC, RHA, RTSA, and mobile crisis. Those are the crisis providers. Now, there are other mental health providers that people are seeing that then after the crisis, those people, I think, are, are uh, directed back towards those. But as, as a result of that, we have a, uh, a crisis continuum committee. It meets every month. And exactly what you're talking about, I think, Commissioner Thompson, is we're trying to work on 
how do we get the most effective and efficient crisis system in Alamance County? How do we make that happen? How do we know when we should be sending people to mobile crisis? What are, what are the areas where they're really good at? You know, right now we distinguish that they're pretty good um, with, with school kids. And we're really working now on them being first in line to work with group homes because that's a huge burden on law enforcement. So we're, we're, we're really looking at how, how do we make that as effective and efficient as possible. So we meet every month to, to work on those pieces. That's the collaboration I think that you're, I think that you're looking for and we're trying to provide that. Well, is that going, does that have a bridge to over here on this side, so to speak? Because it seems like we got this going, we got that going, and other things going, the exchange club, family exchange, whatever, has now got for youth substance abuse, because we need to understand the kids that are smoking weed and doing everything else, because they have learned this as a family business. And I'm not going to get on a box and start preaching. I might. But I just want to make sure that we don't have a section of the bridge that has a big hole in it that we're dropping the ball. Because this isn't about our data. This isn't about our stats. This isn't about Alamance County. Huh. This is about people who are dying. So, so when you think about crisis, I think you got to think about a funnel. Yeah. You know, that it's really difficult for a law enforcement officer who's in the middle of a crisis to have 50 names and try to make a decision about which provider this person is supposed to go to. So we've got one major provider, RHA, that then is at the head of the funnel and then they'll funnel those people out to where they need to be because that makes it really easy for law enforcement and even for ABSS and other referring folks. Um, and it also makes it easiest, I think, for families as well. And we really want to make sure that families, as well as law enforcement, can walk in and have access to that for their loved ones. Well, I just want you to know, this weekend, I had a mother call me. She's got it. Huh, sorry. An elementary age boy who's just been going through hell with all kinds of stuff. And she said, what did I do? I said, you call 911, and they're going to send you two of the best, or one of the best well-trained officers in this field. They're not going to be wearing, I don't have a cop and a siren. They're going to be like two dads showing up. And I said, they are so well-trained to help your kid. And he's, he's somewhere right now. It's the hardest thing she's ever done in her life. But I just thank you, and thank you. Thank you for all the players that have been in this way to get there. But we've still got so much to do, big time. Agree. You talked about a debt. Sorry. Dude. I'm sorry, Mr. Turner. I think you'd asked me right this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have two questions, Mr. Motley. The first is about a data point which really jumped out to me during your presentation, okay. and that's for um, departures that are involuntary. 146 last year, 149 this year up till now, which is about a fourth. So a, about a fourth of the folks who come into the, the diversion center, whether they got there voluntarily or involuntarily, are leaving involuntarily. Can you tell me why why that is? Sure. So one of the um, <coughs> responsibilities of that diversion center is to evaluate people, right, to see if they need further treatment and if they can go voluntarily or if their acuity is too high that they need to go involuntarily, right? So under custody papers right. to ensure that they stay in that treatment, right, for three to five days. And so that involuntary paperwork is saying you're under custody of, of, of law enforcement or, you know, you don't have the right to choose to leave that treatment. Um, and that's really about the acuity of someone and their ability to make decisions. Not anyone, not um, any person can put someone under an involuntary commitment. There's specialized training for that evaluation to put someone under But this. if you're leaving involuntarily, does that mean that you want to stay? Usually um, not, right? Or I just want to go home, right? And they may not be safe enough to go home. And so they're put under that paperwork. So where, where do they depart to? 
Um, sometimes, or most of the time, it's um, community hospitals that are set up to take those commit, you know, individuals under an IBC for a three to five day stay. Okay. So places like the Behavioral Health Inpatient Unit at Alamance Regional or Old Vineyard in Winston-Salem. All right. Do you have patients who want to stay in some kind of treatment that are not referred to other treatment or that you can't serve? Because that's what that that's how I was interpreting that data yeah. point. It sounds like that, that was incorrect. Yeah. But are there people who come in and want treatment who have to leave treatment? Do we not have enough treatment options? The only time that someone under the crisis center would have to leave is if they're waiting for a bed, like I just talked about, right. and we're closing, okay. right? That are volunteering. Okay, that, that's that's helpful. The, the other question is about payment. Um, there's, there's different payment categories for Medicaid and then there's indigent state funded. How, I understood that indigent state funded was Medicaid. So how does the state fund an indigent, why would an indigent, indigent patient not have Medicaid and why would the state then fund that person outside of Medicaid? Yeah, so um, those people who are indigent or state funded do not have any insurance, right? Okay. So they don't qualify for Medicaid or uh, another insurance. Okay. And so the state has set aside some funding for individuals so that they can continue to receive services. Okay. Um, is that funding equivalent to a Medicaid reimbursement? It is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. The situation that we just recently experienced this week, past week, um, we did it, but I mean, Michigan, I think it was. Um, I read that some of the teachers had, had knowledge of some of what the young man was writing and was alluding to. Do we have, are we keeping our teachers informed on the kind of things to be alerted to, kind of red flags, if you will, that they should be referring somebody for evaluation? I can't speak for the school system, right? I know they do a lot of trainings with their teachers. Um, we do, we haven't done it this year, but last year we hosted all of the school social workers at our office, number one, so they knew where we were, right, and what we did, and number two, so we could build that relationship with them. I can tell you when Meredith Pepley, who's the Crossroads director now, was at Cardinal, she was strong for doing that, especially with suicide prevention, and also that, because I requested her speak with our guidance counselors and social workers, and also we do live shooter trainings. I thought, you need to know, you need to do live shooter trainings, because how many fires burn schools down? You need to do live shooter trainings, and that was a across the board thing that we did with the sheriff's department, Bronze PD, everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that is not something that you train for. And we're good to go. That is constant training because evil changes, and you have to be on top of it. Because I don't mean be ugly, but you ask any officer, and they'll say it's not if, it's when. We've been really blessed here. Amen. If we expand this facility and have the uh, H-16 beds and so forth, uh, those are not long-term, is that correct? That's correct. They I are. keep hearing on the radio that it's going to be forever and we're providing a... That's not the case at all, is it? No. Right. No. The average stay is five days for individuals, but it can go from, you know, three to ten. Um, and that gives you time to do the proper placement. Right, or stabilize on medication, right? Start a new medication um, or detox from alcohol or drugs. There's a couple of different options that it provides. And I think, John, this is where Recovery Court can come in really strongly because we saw in Orange County how for one year, if you're accepted in this program, you have a second shadow with you constantly for support, accountability, and everything. And I, I mean, mental health, this, this is just what life is. A large portion of our homeless population is this population. Families get exhausted. They just don't know what to do. Sooner or later, they have to just make hard choices that are just horrendous. So um, this, this is a population that's always going to need constant support. Kind of like your kid. They never get out of your checkbook. You know, same thing. But uh, it's just very important that we look at this with big, wide eyes open. Um, this isn't like you do this without Dream of Genie and it's done or you have a magic wand. If we had have a wand, the sheriff would be living in the Bahamas. He wouldn't have a jail. And so uh, it would just, I know he's wishing. 
but um, <laughs> it's just something you have to just somehow get your mind around because this is um, these are our families and our family members, and I think we're supposed to care for them until they can care for themselves. This is your shot. How desperately do we need this expanded facility? Um, I completely support the idea of a 24-hour diversion center with a center where people can stay for an average of five days. Um, it creates a one-stop shop for this community, right? No wrong door for mental health or substance use. You can, you know, be in crisis, you can stabilize, and then you can, re you know, enter your recovery pathway all in the same place. Um, and I think that speaks volumes. Board, any other questions? Well, I guess I have one other question. Is 16 beds enough? Um, I mean, there's, six, there's, there's some overnight beds, I think, in the plan that we've seen, and then there's 16 yeah. five to 10 day beds. The state only allows six up to 16 beds before it becomes under the hospital licensing gotcha. rules. Okay. Um, even though those centers that hospitals are running now can't go over, right? So you can't be a hospital and still go over 16 beds, right? Um, under that license, that facility license. Is that separate like the children's unit? Will that all be under the 16? Okay. No, you okay. can't um, co-locate adults and children, well, right? I mean that, but I mean, is that number encompassing like the youth and the adults, would that be a total of 16? Or would it just be 16 in the adult and something else in the young people? So right now, what we have been asked to provide is the crisis center, so chairs that you can stay in for 24 hours for adults and children, right? So adults and children in that center can stay up to 23 hours and 59 minutes, right? If an adult needs further treatment and stabilization, they could move over to the facility-based crisis center. However, we have a great partnership with Alexander Youth Network who has opened up the new um, child and adolescent facility-based crisis center in Greensboro, right? And so currently we work together. If those children need more, we can send them there. Sheriff Johnson, do you want to add to this conversation or informational? I would just like to say that uh, <clears throat> my personal opinion, we need a diversion center. Look around our country, the school shootings and the, and the kids with mental health conditions. Let's look at, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of mental health cases that come into my jail and our detention center that may not be there had they received the proper treatment prior to violating the law. And I know, uh, you know, run something like this costs money, but how do you put a price on a life of an individual? You don't. Thank you. Thank you. Repetition costs money too, over and over and over. We thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next on our agenda is the uh, request for the adjustment to the fire district. Uh, Mr. Payne, you want to hear? <laughs> yeah, I mean, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, just want to give you updates. Since last meeting, I was asked to go out and visit with the other homeowner that's involved. I think the map's up there on the screen. This also should be in your packet. Uh, on Sunday, uh, November 21st, myself and Chief Anderson visited a property located at 1835 North Highway 49. This property is owned by Marco Garcia. The front of it is in Hall Rivers District at this time. The back of the property is in Pleasant Grove District, so it is split. We spoke to Mr. Garcia about the proper uh, property district adjustment. He's in approval of it. The next day I visited Sean Tenser, town manager of Hall River. He was aware of the comments made at the commissioner meeting the, the meeting before this one. Uh, he uh, spoke to his mayor and his council. They're still in agreement to give this property up, these three parcels. I got a letter last week that's also in your packet from the board of directors at Pleasant Grove, the Northeastern Fire Department. They are also in agreement to take these three properties on to provide uh, offer fire and emergency service to these three properties. Um, I thought more people was going to be here today from Pleasant Grove. They're out actually been checking my phone. Two departments are out on a brush fire as we speak right now. So I got one guy out there for that. So they're busy. Um, two of the property owners are here today. Both Andersons are here. Mr. Garcia was working. He does construction, so he cannot attend, but he is in support of the fire district switch or adjustment. Uh, this is in no way to retain the chief. 
Um, I know I said that he could not only be chief if he lived in the district. He is up for nomination tonight. He could be beat out in the election, but they do still want to move forward with this procedure. Board, any questions? These properties that are being swapped are, are pretty much contiguous, correct? That's correct, yeah. And they're just across the road from each other. Oh, there's no the swapping. No swapping. Well, I mean, from one district to another. Yes, yeah, they're, they butt up to the line. So we would not do like a satellite annexation or anything like that. Right. Um, it'd have to be continuous in the fire district adjustment. Good question. Any other questions? <clears throat> Would there be any significant difference in the response time from Hall River to the properties they acquire versus the properties that they had before? The way it looks to me is which side of the road do they go to? That's right. Hall River, would, Hall River would respond across the road. So if there's a structure fire, you can get four station response. It'll be multiple station responding. Uh, emergency medical call, you'll get Pleasant Grove if this is a uh, Adjusted on the right, Anderson property and also the Garcia property. Mm -hmm. If there's um, on the left side, uh, across the road, where it's that station four, if 911 is called, Hall River would respond for emergency medical service along with Alamance County EMS. The only other comment I would have, uh, I'm sure that every board member has received a number of calls. And I assure you that I and the other board members have all listened to those calls we paid attention uh, and we've looked at the details. Uh, the fact that we haven't been able to call you back does not mean that we didn't listen and we certainly do care. Right. There was a, a message put out last night uh, by the gentleman who spoke last time saying that myself and the chief had an arrangement to get this done. There's no arrangement. I'm just in the middle presenting. Uh, I guess y'all take care of the arrangement. <laughs> just to forward with your, with your vote. So I have nothing to do with it. I'm just a middleman presenting. I might also state that we have nothing to gain or lose. Absolutely. <laughs> that is correct. Absolutely. We're simply in the middle of the well. Do you, do you want a question or do you want a comment? I'd like a motion. I didn't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you have a question? No, but I have a comment. I guess I'll do it during discussion, whatever you want me to. I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've answered my phone to many people. I've gone to lunch with some people, and I just want to say I have met the best people in the world, no matter what your opinion is on this. Uh, being a volunteer for anything is the main people in this world that's going to make it better because you show up for no money, you show up to make a difference. And um, from what I've understood, this has kind of gone back to um, a couple of buddies. I had asked Mr. Payne for a mediator because I think more important, I know you all are about saving your community with what it is you do. You never know what you're going to walk into when you are a front first responder. Um, but more important is your perception to your community because things like this can, can get out of hand. They can be like, I always say, changing carpet in a Baptist church. It can get like a <laughs> war. I was a Sunday school superintendent and I went through that and you don't know the conditions and the way people feel about things in their heart and you have to respect that. And I, I don't think you're going to lose no matter what because of the caliber and character of people that serve at this fire department. I know who works at Eli Whitney and, and boy, they, all they do is save people and that's all you sign up for. And that should really tell you a lot about what you see as far as for you in this world. But um, I, I just don't want, I hate to see when friends can be divided on something like this um, because that can um, cause a big distraction. And you don't ever want the people you serve to wonder if you're thinking about them or if you're thinking about your distraction. So I just want to thank you all for your commitment to saving lives. There is no amount of money or art money in the world that could pay you for your worth. And that goes along with anybody that's in this kind of 911 business. So um, I just I just want to thank you all, both sides, because um, when my John just had to have these second phones, and now I've got both of them tied inside of my head, and I don't even know my number. I, I have to just like put, call back automatically. So um, I just, before I say anything, before I vote, just know that I vote on principle. I really do. And I just appreciate all what you do. And I don't ever want you to lose sight of how important you are and what you do for your community because your community could burn down without you. People could die without you. And children could get lost without you. And um, I can't put a price on that. So that's it. 
I'm wait, waiting on a motion. Motion to approve. I'll second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. All opposed? No. Did you vote yes or no? I voted aye. So we have three to two. It passes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Atkins. I didn't mean to run everybody off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a tax man will do for you. That's what a tax man will do for you. Well, you know, anytime I'm crossing the road over here, yeah, you know, I keep saying you have to be very careful because somebody that, that's coming through, they might recognize me, they might know what I do. <laughs> Suddenly they hit the gas, you know, you have to be careful. Um, so good morning. Thank good you morning. for uh, speaking with me today. Got an update on the 2023 revaluation. Uh, so we'll kind of walk through that together. See if this works. It does. So I want to start with the timeline, uh, just some, you know, 20,000 feet broad overview of the, what this process looks like. The very first uh, point on my calendar is already done, uh, September 1st, 2021, uh, to start the initial research and planning phase. Uh, we've allocated about three months' time, so that was our, our start time for that, just to look at the market in a general sense. Uh, now, thankfully, this time around, the vast majority of that work is being done by Vincent Valuations, the uh, company that we've brought in to help and to support. And the last reval, that was me, and that's a substantial amount of research that I've been able to hand to someone else. I, I do appreciate that. Uh, but we've begun research again. It's, it's a big picture. You know, I, I've always been amazed in, in a standard appraisal report, uh, just if you have your, your home appraised, they'll talk about some national trends and some regional trends. And I always thought, my goodness, the house is on Apple Street. I, I, don't, I don't understand. But <laughs> That's the context that all appraisals occur in. So, you know, we can kind of begin with the big picture and work our way back in. Our next critical date has already passed and, and we're on schedule there. October 13th, we had our kickoff meeting. So we brought all the staff together for a full day and we looked at the last revaluation. Uh, what do we think worked well? What needs improvement? What have we kind of learned through using our, our schedule over the years? What are we seeing in the, the market, changes, concerns, uh, and trying to lay a groundwork for, for what is expected in the revaluation to come. The next critical date, December 1st, we just hit that one. Uh, schedule of values calibration and testing has begun. So after the three months of initial research, we're now making it applied. So the schedule of values is our pricing guide. It, it tells us what we're gonna charge per square foot of different types of like uh, heated living area versus porches versus garages for different types of commercial buildings. And how do we adjust for age and condition and quality? Uh, how do we approach land valuations? That sort of thing. And so based on that research, we're now fitting it to the data that we have in our computer system and beginning to see what picture emerges and begin to calibrate that and, and try to model the market. We have just begun that process the next major date for us is March 1st. That's when we're going to begin kind of the, the meat of the revaluation work. This is where the appraisers on staff and the tax department begin to review neighborhoods. Now we are mass appraisers, and so we begin with the forest to find our way to the trees. Uh, so we'll take a neighborhood at a time and begin with questions such as what are land values in the neighborhood? Set some consistent land rates. Uh, what are some consistent um, quality factors? Are there any influence factors? For example, if you've got a residential neighborhood beside an industrial facility, there might be an impact there. We need to consider that and make sure we treat all the neighbors in a similar way. So we work from the neighborhood in to the individual properties. We've got about 880 neighborhoods to go through, so this is a one-year project. And now this does not consume our full time because we still are keeping up with permits as are being issued. Of course, there are citizen concerns and appeals we have to handle, uh, land splits we have to go through and work. There's a number of, of other functions. Um, it will consume 
about two days out of every week dedicated to reevaluation and about three days dedicated to everything else which means our staff's normal five-day allocation has been crunched to three so please bear with us if we're a little bit slower in responding to some things where uh, we have sufficient capacity but it does bog us down and we have to work based on efficiency more than convenience in these circumstances. So after a year of these reviews, we should have everything taken care of. We should have initial values to send out to the public. So March of 2023, we'll do a mass mailing to all property owners, let them know what the values are. And this begins kind of a, a feedback from the public where they have a chance to tell us if they have any concerns. This is very important to me. Uh, no matter how hard we work, we will never know the citizen's property better than they know their own property. So if they have any concerns, one of our goals is to be as responsive as possible. Uh, step one, when they raise their hands, is our appraisal staff will follow up with them, see if there's anything that's an easy fix, easy solution to take care of. Obviously, if we come to a point that we feel comfortable in the work we've done and we have a disagreement with the citizen, then there's the Board of Equalization and the various appeal boards from there. But most things are handled very quickly in office. Again, citizens know their properties and it's a big help for us to get the feedback. Now we'd like to open the Board of Equalization by May 1st, 2023. Honestly, mid-April is better. Um, I don't know if the logistics will work out for that, but the sooner we can open, the better. Uh, what I want to avoid are any kind of bottlenecks. Um, as we'll discuss in just a moment, I am anticipating a lot of appeals and one of the things that becomes difficult is if you have a lot of appeals coming in at once and you don't have a method in place to funnel those through and keep them flowing. You know, if, if I'm a citizen and I'm concerned about my value and I send in an appeal and I hear crickets, sooner or later that's going to be a problem. We need to very quickly be able to get back with them and the ones that we still can't come to an agreement with, very quickly get them to that board so they can begin processing through uh, so the folks aren't waiting forever. It all kind of comes to a close. Uh, July 21st is our target date, 2023, to mail the tax bills. So the question is when will the effects of the revaluation actually hit, and that will be July of 2023. That's when the bills go out. Now, I don't think we'll be done with appeals by then. I would I'd be very happy if that's not true, uh, but I remember what happened in 2009. I hope it's not 2009 level appeals, it but it, it can go. It, it looks that way. Yeah, it can go on for months, and so we'll still be handling appeals probably while bills are going out. Um, obviously, if we make any uh, corrections uh, based on an appeal, we'll then correct the bill as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the lay of the land, what we're looking at going forward. Now, a major concern that I have talking about uh, why do I say we're going to have a lot of appeals. Um, I went to Zillow.com. I like going to Zillow.com because anybody can go there and look behind me, right? If we're talking about my personal data, one, it's, it's easier for me to get to than it is the average citizen. And two, I'm the one that controls it. So yeah, I think a person would be justified in having a little bit of mistrust if I'm always drawing from my data. Zillow, anybody can go look over my shoulder. Uh, they publish statistics. Um, word of caution about Zillow. Zillow, I'll have uh, folks carry into me a Zestimate and say I've had an appraisal done on my property. Uh, Zillow is not providing appraisals. That is not what it is. Um, in fact, recently they've uh, gone into a business venture where they said, well, we know what properties are worth, so we're going to buy low and sell high. We're going to use our Zestimates versus for sale offerings, and we're going to make a bundle. Are you saying Zestimates because they're zestimates. Zillow? That's what they are. They're Zillow's Zestimates. That's their word. For That's it. their word. You know you something. You got your own. <laughs> well, when they, when they went into this process, they lost their shirts. Absolutely. Um, and it kind of illustrated its is strengths and weaknesses. What I like Zillow for is aggregate data. By the time you zoom out, they're really good, really useful. When you zoom into an individual property, mm, mm, maybe, maybe not, there, there's uh, problems. They're not consistent. There's a real lack of consistency in the quality of the values. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, when I'm looking at these, I'm looking at the aggregates. And I would say, too, um, anytime you're using an auto, automated valuation system, uh, you have the same problems. 
when you zoom out, it looks pretty good. When you zoom in, a lot of times it's, it's real iffy. They've got uh, software in our industry that helps with uh, placing property values and it has the exact same issues. Uh, someone has to come behind each and every one, so you've got the software piece and the human piece, or else you get that inconsistency. If I look at the aggregate, starting with January 2017, the average, these are home sales, the average home sale, or home value, pardon, in North Carolina was 177,000. For Burlington, it was 110, Mevin was 181. And you can see that we have healthy growth, right? We're up 6.5% per Zillow in one year. There's another 5.5% growth, another 6.5% growth. We, we have seen a very strong, unusually strong market. Um, as we walk forward, though, here we are in January of 2021. We've picked up over 8%. Here we are in October. 19% in the year is not out. So per Zillow, we're up 55% since rebound. Fun, right. fun, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the question is, is that accurate? Because I've just questioned Zillow's accuracy, but I said their statistics on a large scale are good, so I draw through our internal data just to check against that. Now, we work off of uh, sales ratios predominantly. That's the easiest way for me to view data. So that's the way I'm reporting it. I took all the sales occurring from July 1st of 2016 through June 30th, 2017. So our assessment date is January 1st. This bracket's six months before and after. Um, and I'll note, this is revaluation. I could see the first six months of sales. I couldn't see the next six months. They were blind. But even blind, we were at 100.14%. And so we were at market at the time. Um, as we walk forward in our ratios, now, this is a difference from Zillow. We show the next year being 3.83%, but it may be because I'm pulling a whole year and the year is in motion. So it's, it may be the way that I'm looking at it. In the following year, this is now aggregate. This is not a year-to-year -year change. Our total increase is 10.5%. Our total increase is 15.8. So that would be 5% between those two years. These are not year-to-year -year changes. These are total. If I track with them to today, I get to 56.54%. So when, when they say we're up 55%, yep, mm -hmm, I think so. Our internal data tracks exactly with that. Uh, these are all the sales that occurred in October versus their tax values would indicate 55%. These are residential numbers. These are, well, these are all sales, uh, residential, commercial, vacant land, anything that's sold. Okay. Zillow's is residential. Okay. Uh, and so that's, that's what it seems to be. Um, what's going to happen next? That's anybody's guess. Uh, speaking of Zillow, they're the most bullish that I've heard on this market. And they're looking for another 15, maybe 20 percent by the time our revaluation hits. Well, if that's true, we're going to be up 70, 75 percent. And just want to let that number sink in because it's taking some time for me to, to let that number sink in. What are you going to do with that 70 What are you talking about? You, you're not going to raise my property taxes no. 70%. Not the bill. Not unless you ask for it. This is not. so your kind of conversation. Like, <laughs> you just like high on this. Well, see, the great I thing know about, what you're about I know the words that come out of his mouth before he even says it. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. Uh huh. Well, you've seen my slides anyway. Yes, sir. <laughs> I actually slept with him last night, and I just want to tell my county commissioners that every word that you have in this document is 100% true. Mm -hmm. There's you. nothing in there. Thank not you. even the A or the Ats are not that. <laughs> Everything's perfect, and I appreciate it, Jeremy. Thank you. Appreciate that. But back to my question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're not going to raise my property taxes 70%. <coughs> it's, it's you. <laughs> you know where I am. I'll get you. <laughs> I don't understand how this is That's like California. Important. You cannot do that to this country. That, that is important, and, and this is my biggest concern. When I say we're going to have a lot of appeals, this is my biggest concern. I wouldn't say appeals, quite the word. Well, torches, pitchforks. Torches. You don't know what Frankenstein felt like Look. in the tower. I'm, I'm going to move my office near the back door <laughs> so that when they line up in front, I'll try to run away. Um, this Mr. Perkins, is let, let yeah. me interrupt you and save your bacon. <laughs> <laughs> who, who sets the tax rate? 
this board. Yep. Exactly. And revenue neutral mm -hmm. has a meaning. Yes. And so we can mm -hmm. lower the tax rate mm -hmm. to take into, into consideration yeah. that increase in valuation. So that you're the person that would increase your tax bill. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> got me a poster. <laughs> no way. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. no. I had this, uh, this conversation uh, Saturday night. I was uh, at a dinner, and the person sitting at the table said, I hate to ask you about work at dinner, but what's happening with values, the revaluation? What are we expecting? So I kind of gave him the talk. Do you mean to tell me my taxes are going to go up 75%? <laughs> no doubt my cousin. <laughs> well, and, but this is uh, what I'm very concerned about, and I think that, that we should be very concerned about, is that when we put this message out to the public, that's going to be the number one response. That is a common sense response to this. I've just said it's going to go up 75%, and I know what I'm paying now. I, I can't afford that, right? And that's where we've got to find a way to get clarity to our citizens. We're not saying your bill is going to go up 75%. There's a difference between your value going up and your bill going up, and the difference is the tax rate. Now, if we left the tax rate alone, yeah, sure, it would go up 75%. But what's going to happen is when we see the new tax base compared to what the budget requires, that rate will fall back down, presumably, I'm presuming this board, right. would be somewhere in the vicinity of revenue neutral. And then at that point, the bill that I pay may be the same as it always was. So what will determine if my bill goes up? How, how can I tell someone with confidence their bill will go up? If their value goes up more than average, their bill will go up. If their value goes up less than average, their bill will go down. So you can have someone go 50% on value, but if the average was 75, their bill goes down. What do you mean my, my value went up 50% and my bill reduced? Well, you're, you're behind the curve. You're not, not average. And that's the purpose of revaluation is to get people compared to each other, not compared to an absolute number, but compared to each other back into balance. So are your people behind the curve type people? Behind the curve. <laughs> Help me with that. It's like you said 75 and maybe mine would be 50, so mine wouldn't go up. Is this your kind of people? I, my, I don't know. <laughs> I have people everywhere. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just feeling really sick. <laughs> so, so this, but this is the, the key thing: is to get the message to, to break the concept that my value changes, my bill change. They're they're not. They have a, a relationship with one another, but it's not. And, and this board. Now this is where now I am a humble tax administrator, um, but I would say that statements by this board are powerful. And so I would never pressure you to talk about tax rates at this juncture, but. The more that the board talks about revenue neutral, I think That's the more confidence our right citizens there, yeah. will have. Um, if, if the board is like, yeah, revenue neutral plus five. That's going to make people real antsy, and then they're going to come find me. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just putting that out there. That, that's the key thing. So we're looking at trying to get as much communication on the front end so the citizens know what to expect on their increase and what does that mean and what options will they have. Get as much of that on the front end. And then the moment those notices are out, it's about keeping that flow open on the back end. If they've got a question, that they get immediate res responses. I mean, obviously, we can't keep up with a huge rush. We're going to lag a little bit. But how, how little can that lag be? That's going to make a huge so difference. Just to use a hypothetical, mm -hmm. just to use a hypothetical, Pam, if, if property values go up 75%, mm -hmm. where our current rate is at 66 mm -hmm. It's 66 cents. 66, mm -hmm. yes. So our tax rate, if it's adjusted, hypothetically could come down to 46 mm -hmm. cents. So it would be adjusted down to be revenue. New. I'm just throwing out a number. I'm not doing the math. Mm -hmm. But instead of being charged the 66 cents on a 75% increase in your property value, you get charged the lower rate, mm -hmm. which keeps your tax rate the same that it was before. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be able to. That's what we need to be able to articulate to our citizens, so they understand that revaluation is not going to drive their bill up. It's just going to create a proper base for us to analyze and and, and tax our run I mean, our tax rate. This is like at. an automatic trigger for people to go, "Oh my gosh!" Oh yeah. Because any any words with tax is just it's just taboo, and so. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to have to have a little talk show on the website to call Jeremy, Jeremy to talk about this because I just think it's so important that we communicate with our public because, I mean, it's kind of like that cow that eats the grass and every week he's, his roast is more expensive, but he's still eating that same grass. I don't understand how that works, but that's not why I run a food line. So I just make sure we, just like everything, communication just to reassure our public. But, you know, in this day and time, people need to be reinsured to feel safe from all kind of stuff like this. There's enough arrows shooting everybody as it is. The concern that I've got is this. Uh, he guesstimated the bills would go out in July of 2023. Guess what? We have to set the tax rate prior to June 30 exactly. of that same year. Mm -hmm. So if the people don't even know what their tax bills are and we don't uh, have all these complaints yet and the evaluations or the hearings, the whatever, uh, it's going to make it kind of questionable. Uh, and that, that's uh, do we need the, to adjust the time frame well, that's, is the question. That's the challenge with the time frame. Now, if, if we notice folks on March 1st and we don't bill, or, or let's say a, a tax rate is set in June, but we notice them in March, those couple of months, there's no way to tell them what the bill will be. You know, we can project if it's revenue neutral, but it's always an estimate. Um, that's something we could consider in our form of notice. Uh, for example, we could, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm talking here, we could estimate a revenue neutral rate, but it would be an estimate that early in the process because what we don't know is what's going to happen on appeal. By the time that it's set in June and billed in July, we'll have really good indicators on what appeals are doing. And, and I'm very confident that we'll know what our base is well enough to establish a rate and move forward. But in March, I don't know. There's not enough time to mm -hmm. complete all that and the hearings and everything else before our and, last and, June and, meeting. And there never are uh, when counties have any kind of large response, uh, which can be every reval in, in some cases. We were very fortunate last time uh, because our values, the, the market had dipped and returned, so we were only up 2% because we rode that, mm -hmm. that low. Well, we had very few appeals. Nobody appeals over a 2% increase when the market's doing great. Um, this will be different. And, and many times that's the normal. Last time is, is the unusual case. Um, I would still want to notice them as early as possible to get the appeals underway as early as possible so that I could then tell this board what to expect. What I wouldn't want to do is, is wait, guess at what those appeals are going to look like, and then guess wrong, high or low. So I like to be able to see them come in. But that small window is where well, I don't know what your bill will be. Again, I could estimate a revenue neutral as of the best information I have. But everyone have to know that is an estimate. I, I won't know that early in the process, um, which is why messaging is important. You know, if I can speak to someone and say our commissioners are committed to revenue neutral or at least something close to it, that gives me a much better position than I have no idea. You know, so so the more we can have confidence there. You don't have to set the tax rate by July first, do you? Oh, I, I think so. Yeah. Do you have to? Yeah. Yes. Uh, our budget has to be set by June 30. Yeah. That's what I was telling you about mm -hmm. the little the window that he was just speaking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a jet fighter, it's like you firing 6,000 miles away trying to fit it into a three foot window. That's what oh, he's he talking about. Jeremy, <laughs> 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 you can do it. Right. 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 But you see, what he's, so what he's saying is exactly, exactly <laughs> perfect because <laughs> I'm glad you're telling him this because. That is true. I mean, we can dot our I's, cross our T's, and do everything exactly right, and guess what happens? Let me ask the county attorney. It doesn't, it doesn't work out the way we think because there's so many variables mm -hmm. that we can't put our finger on. Now, if we could put some thing on, we can make it happen mm -hmm. because we know the variables, they're, sure. they're, they don't move. Mm -hmm. But this is tough. This is going to be tough. Didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you. I was, oh, it's, I thought it's all you, good. You it's, all good. All. it's all good. Asking the uh, county attorney, we set the tax rate as required by law on or before June 30 of uh, that year, 2023. Can we go back and readjust it in the new, in the next tax year? Of course. You you mean for 2024? Yes. Sure. For, for the 2023-24 year, taxable year. Yeah, you can set your tax rate every year. 
Can we, budget? You're, you're talking can about we, setting it for 2324, then coming back in fiscal year 2324 and voting to change the tax rate during no. the fiscal year. Yeah, that's my question. It's a stone thing. It's uh, I didn't think we could do that. Yeah. Let me ask you that, let me ask another way it's going to count. What about if we get into this area and it's a little bit foggy, a little mm -hmm. bit? Could we, let's say that the board. I'm just everything I'm giving is hypothetical. We can go three or four different ways. Does that ways. mean I can give you a hypothetical answer? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so good yes, about this. Just making sure. It's like just picking. What if we, working with Jeremy and the board, and we say, okay, we want our tax rate to be, this is just exact, 65 cents, okay? But we need to keep that rate constant in the next year. Could we, for our taxpayers, if we so choose, could we give them a rebate for this year? No. We, we couldn't say, okay, we're going to set the tax rate at 65 cents, but this year we're going to give you a tax rebate of one penny. No. You, you set that. your tax rate each year, and you can adjust the next year looking back based on what happened, but you, but you can't give back. State law doesn't allow so that. So in essence what you're telling me is if I want to do what I just said, I have to set it in stone first, for example. If the board agrees that the tax rate is going to be 65 cents, but this year we want to give the taxpayers a penny rebate on your taxes, just all hopped up. Could we do that? No. I can't set it now. For, give give my taxpayers a penny back, and then but next year our tax rate is going to stay the same. I'm going to give you a penny back this year. I, I maybe the, we're the saying the different things. You you can't give money back. Okay, you, you can't do that. You set your tax rate, you adopt your budget, and that's it for that fiscal year. And you have to, as you all know, do that before June finishes, which is why he's in this difficult challenge. Sure. But it's, it's that way for every county across the state. You're facing the same issues because of state law. What you, the only thing you can do then is going into the next year, if, if you think, wow, we really end up with a surplus higher. You, you know you all have to have so much in reserve required by state law. A lot of counties carry more than that for emergencies, which is good given what we've seen happen in the last two years. But whatever you determine you want your savings account, if you still are above that, then that next year is when you say, okay, we're going to do a penny less. But you can't do it in the middle of the year once it's all been established. Does that help answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Right. In short, we can't use the word rebate and really mean it. Ever. <laughs> I will tell you that there are very few reasons that you as commissioners can forgive or change a tax, and, and really very few. And if you deviate from that, it's, and I know none of you would, but just for your information, it's actually a class two misdemeanor to do that. That's how serious and controlled they are about tax issues under state law. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Well, Mr. Atkins, one, one quick question. The, it, if you sent out notices February 1st, 2023 instead of March 1st, 2023, then that eliminates the window, doesn't it? It, it enlarges the window, gives us more time. Right, but it, it reduces the window where there's uncertainty for the board right. because it moves everything up and now we have the information yes. we need to set the tax rate appropriately. But it takes a 12 month, month project, yes. it turns into an 11 month project, and, and we're, we're tight. <laughs> we're, we're tight. I, I mean, we would certainly attempt it, but I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. And, and that's the other thing is I'm, I'm pretty confident that by the time we get to June, We'll have enough data to know what we're into, what we're going to see. Uh, I really need to see kind of the initial response, but we'll have a few months of, of that initial data. And really, a lot of the, the change is going to be very, very quick when right. folks bring things to our attention. We are not uh, antagonistic with our, our citizens on appeals. Uh, it's not uh, something where we're trying to win, it's we're trying to get it right. And so, uh, a very high percentage of persons that, that bring concerns are legitimate concerns, and we quickly address them. Um, so, so a lot of that will, will come in very fast and then slow down. The, the window of uncertainty is pretty narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if I wonder if we could turn a 12-month process into an 11 and a half-month process. I mean, <laughs> any, I mean, seriously, I, I any you. any 
any little bit of room can, can give us the information that we need. I mean, small so, tweaks can matter pretty huge. So here's the concern that I have. Yeah. Um, when we begin uh, in March of this coming year, uh, if we work a neighborhood and look at the sales, and of course we're projecting, right? We, we can't use the sales as they occur because by the end of the year, they're, they're wrong. The market's moved on. And so we have to anticipate where we think the market will be, which is why there's that large research window before we get to the schedule window that we're in now. We get around to the end of that year, now we know a whole lot more about the market than we did in March. And we revisit early valuations. We've done most of the groundwork on it, but we have to say, did our projections work out? If not, what needs to be corrected? A lot of the, the finished work is going back to the early work and trying to make sure we're, we're very consistent. If anything in that process, in, in the intent to finish faster, to have a larger window, causes the, the quality of the work to fall because we can't really check all the check boxes, we have to skip a few, we could end up with worse values, which leads to more appeals. Those more appeals eat up the window we had in the first place, but now we've got worse values and more appeals. So that, that's the only concern. The, the way that that can work um, is to put more emphasis on it. Like if, if we wanted to try to reinforce what we have in-house with additional outsourced elements so that we're, we're reducing the time but we're increasing the resources, that would widen the window, but it would also increase the cost. So that, that's something that I'd be very comfortable with other than it would increase the cost. Um, is this something that we need to do some community education about? 100%. I know the planning board did that mm -hmm. concerning the snow camp and all that. Mm -hmm. To really start talking about that instead of bam in the newspaper and it's this way and everybody reads an article different. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it would cause people uncertainty, mm -hmm. not in this world. You know, in the last revaluation, which like I said was thankfully a very mild response, uh, we had town hall meetings all over the place. I did my speaking tour. <laughs> And of course, all, all your different uh, clubs and associations and things like that, and we want to bring that to the next level this time. Uh, try to, to uh, communicate uh, with uh, print media, try to get myself on the radio. Not that I want to be on the radio, but try to get myself on the radio. <laughs> but anything that I can do uh, to, to communicate, because the more we can have an understanding at the beginning of this process, the less trouble we're going to have at the end. Well, I think with what we're hearing at the national level, mm -hmm. constantly something all the time, I think our county needs to be really strong and set and consistent. Mm -hmm. And the more we can talk to people in person, mm -hmm. I just think it's better. You can just be Elvis. Go for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You and Haygood. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I just think a, a three-month window may sound like a lot of time, no. but it's not. That means in 30 days, after at the end of that three-month window, that first of June, to the end of June, we've got to come up with a tax rate when we finalize our budget. Could you have some idea about the number of appeals we're getting? Mr. Turner's concern are also my major concerns. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, these tax bills going out in July, mm -hmm. having had that tax rate set mm -hmm. in our second meeting in June, mm -hmm prior to the July mail-out, mm -hmm. July 21st, in fact, that's almost two months after we, or at least a full month mm -hmm. after we uh, set the tax rate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the March 1st of 2022, appraisers begin neighborhood reviews. Mm -hmm. Can you back that up a month and start the process 30 days earlier? The problem is there, we're all standing in line. And every, I'm going to look before I back up because I've backed into people. Every time I back up, I might back into the person behind me. So right now, and I just walked away from the microphone, I don't, they don't like that. Um, right now, the, the problem is that we're finishing our 2022 values, and we can't start 2023 until 2022 are done. So in order to start it a month earlier, we have to finish 2022 a month earlier. Now can that be done? Very, with great difficulty, maybe. Uh, it's a, it's a three-month process for us to do our year in. So, all of our values are as of January 1st, but obviously, unlike Santa Claus, we can't be everywhere in a day. And so what we do is the month of December and the month of January are the last visit months. When I show up, I'm going to either project forward or project backwards to January 1st and say, okay, this is what it is, and move on. 
And then February is getting everything into the computer system, doing any final value work that I need to do so that we can get notices in March. This is our, our standard. We can try to crunch that down, but we're already in month one of, of that process. We have a lot less lead. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to do that. Um, I, I do think with three months, because we'd have March, April, and May before everything set in June, the, the nice thing is that we'd be able to see the strength of the response. We'd be able to see any major issues that we might have. We'd be able to see some initial response at the board level to see what those percentages look like converting from what we call an informal to a formal appeal. And that will give us a lot of direction. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to have that three month window as a basis. But I'm certainly in favor of, of a longer window. Um, but we don't, we are not staffed to do that. Um, we, we, we can do it only at the expense of quality work. Um, we can add staff to do that. Not, obviously we wouldn't hire on because the, the training time alone and then you retain. Um, we could bring experienced people. You know, we're already under contract with Vincent Valuations. And they have teams of experienced people. This is all they do all the time. Yeah, let's go from one county to another and, and work revaluations. If we reinforce staff, we certainly can take that, that time way down. But, but that, if that's the goal, if the goal is to have more time to predict and we want to keep our quality high, to me the only solution is to increase our resources and I would just go with our existing contract and, and expand it and add more resources. Can you report back to us on yes, our May 20 100%. meeting? 100%. So we'll know what the cost and the time element is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll do that. So I, I December think 20. December. December 20. What did I say? May. Uh, I'm sorry. I think that's wise. And, and also, it might be good to, to look into whether we could use some additional staff if we get in a bind at the end of the process. Yes. So that they're available if, if, if for some reason the appeals are high right. and, we're, and we're, we're concerned about the data that we have. Because we, 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 we need the best data we can have yeah. to set the tax rate appropriately. Well, and, and, and I will say, you know, one of my goals as tax administrator is to um, remember this is the citizens' money and to spend it accordingly the way that they would want me to, to do it, the way this board, this board and its predecessors have always been very careful about spending the citizens' money. Uh, anytime I bring something before the board where I ask for expenditures, it's either mandatory, I don't have a choice, or because I can see and show return on investment. If I can't give you return on investment, I don't ask. That being said, to ensure the quality, to ensure that timetable, right, I think it's, it's money well spent if we do spend it. I think it would be, we would be better off to know that we've done a good job and gotten everything in with plenty of time even if it costs a little bit more. I think that would so be So I think wise. we just need to know what, what that more means. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and, and let me reiterate that when I say set the tax rate appropriately, it's very important to me that we have a, a neutral tax rate, yes. a revenue neutral yes. tax rate. And then we can adjust from there. Right. But we need to know what that number is. And I think we had, and I think you mentioned that it's important for uh, the public to understand where the board stands. For me, mm -hmm. revenue neutral is, is, is where I, I land. Um, a, a separate question. Sure. We were talking about speeding up this process, mm -hmm. but on your slide here is the possibility that we may push back and extend the process. And I just quickly want to talk yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the the lead into that is the we're losing money now mm -hmm. because the public utilities are not yes. paying the, the county the full mm -hmm. the full. Can you just briefly just talk about a how much we're losing in tax revenue mm -hmm. because we're pushing because we're waiting to to evaluate the property values to this point. And then secondly, what is that trigger? What What is the trigger where public utilities stop paying us the full value? Exactly, so what happens is that we have to submit a sales ratio report annually, or it's a random sample, it's not every sale in the database, but it's a random sample that the Department of Revenue requires us to submit, where they just say, okay, it sold for this amount, it was valued at that amount, is the department low, high? They measure our consistency of work. This is their quality check on us. Right. Now, when you get below 85%, um, they will 
uh, make you advance your evaluation. That happened to us as well. We went from uh, the ability to do an eight to required to mm -hmm. cut to a seven. Okay. And then if it's below 90 in years one, five, uh, one or five, then they trigger this adjustment to your uh, corporate assessment to your public utilities. Okay. The idea is that with, with everything that we're doing in, in tax assessment, it is to keep folks uh, balanced between one another, that the people are paying a proportionate share. And that's why... You mean commercial to, to residential? All, all, all property types. Okay. And so uh, that's why I say that it doesn't matter how much the value goes up, but how much it goes up relative to your neighbor because okay. we're rebalancing. Well, uh, with corporate assessment, they are revalued every single year. So they're moving forward with the market, whereas the rest of our real property are not. If we get but so far out of step, right. then it's shifting the tax burden onto them, and that trigger shifts it back by, by reducing their assessment. So you're looking at, what, 400000 a year, I think, was the, the number as far as lost revenue from these corporate assessments that we could get, but we're being docked. Okay. And, and that's problematic to us. So I think that funds the revaluation work just to get that restored. And in fact, that's a good reason, you know, this board has opted to go to a four-year cycle after this is all done because 90% is easy to hit uh, just to go ahead and prevent that all together to keep our values much more in step. So, so we're losing $400,000 a year by not revaluate, right. revaluating right. right now. And right. then but also by... by Doing the revaluation now instead of waiting for the eight year period, mm -hmm. we create this buffer so that if the rates go down significantly, we can delay. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we were waiting until the very end of the process, we, we have, would have no choice but to revalue at that moment, regardless of whether there had been a significant decrease. But by doing this, we preserve the option to delay if there's a significant decrease in the property price. And, and that's what happened to us in the 2009 right. revaluation. And when do we need to make that call? December of next year. Okay. So technically, to December 31st, the board can hit the brake. And January 1st, it is what it is. And so by December of next year, if we observe that there's a problem, or a crash is what we're talking about, then we could stop, let it sort itself out a little bit, and send the values the following year. And that way we would be in tune with the, what the markets really were. What happened to us in 2009 was we were at the end of the eight years. There was nowhere to go. And so we end up increasing 24% in the face of a crashing market. We had one third of the properties in the county in the repeal. Because if you put yourself in the, the shoes of the citizen, they don't look at <clears throat> this is an eight year process. It's up versus eight years ago. They just know every day I'm hearing my values are down and the tax department raised me up. We would have the same thing happen now if we were to have a crash. And that's why it's important to have a safety. And it's always at the board's discretion. If the board doesn't want to do it, the board doesn't have to do it. But the board would have the option to say, you know what, push it back a year. Let's get those values back down in line with what's happening now. Okay. And you know what, that very well may happen. I don't know if you're looking mm -hmm. at the, you know, the Federal Reserve and what mm -hmm. they're doing mm -hmm. and, and the way they're approaching this transitory inflation mm -hmm. issue. Um, it's going to be tough. Huh? I mean, next the next six months, mm -hmm. this market's going to go through a transition. Mm -hmm. Talking stocks, bonds, housing everything it's going to go through a transition it's not going to be like it has been in the last five or six years and that's what concerns me about this process right now everything's going in that straight tra you know trend is your friend kind of attitude that's going to change mm -hmm. and when that changes things act crazy mm -hmm. they don't act normally and that's what gives people this problem of Oh geez, what do I do? Because mm -hmm. it's been acting a certain way normally, and now it's not, and that's what we're going to run into. Right. Well, and really, what we're seeing in the market right now exceeds all of my training and all of my mm -hmm. experience. I, I do not know what to make of the year to come, yeah. uh, because there are factors that would support really strong growth, and factors that should tank it, and they're all happening at the same time. Exactly. Uh, it, for example, we're having supply issues. Well, I don't see any of the, the market factors coming down the pipeline making that any better. No. And so those supply issues tend to increase the value of the property because it limits supply 
right, which drives the price up. Mm -hmm. um, there's also signs for um, a strong demand, right? When you have an inflationary period, you use real property as a hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. That can, again, help to boost demand. So you've got these factors that say, well, we're fine. But then you've got issues like, and eh, if we increase the, the mortgage rates because of the strong inflation, you're going to just kill the ability of buyers to, to, to produce. Um, if the supply chain sorts out, or if we just get enough baiting of it, supply opens up a little bit, all of a sudden you turn around. And, and now we have all these downward pressures. And you're right, when there's so much uncertainty, I don't know if it's panic, I don't know what it is that sets in, but all logic begins to fly out the door. So the, the major sources that I see, nobody really mainstream is calling for a crash. They're calling for anything from the really strong growth to maybe a little decline. But they don't but know. They don't know, and I don't either. I don't know. Um, so I like having the safety that we don't have to know until December. I'm glad we have time. <laughs> right. Uh, sometimes well, time will give you a little extra. Mm -hmm. I agree with what Bill's saying. We, I don't know what's going to happen, but we have, we've just thrown an unbelievable amount of extra money into our economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, average household of three or four people, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten thousand dollars in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm that they didn't earn, mm -hmm. I mean, they just came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, they, if, they, if they weren't in a crunch already, and I know some of them were and some of them really needed it, mm -hmm. but if they weren't in a crunch, they got that money and they got burning a hole in their pocket. Mm -hmm. They wanted it out and spend TVs. it. That's right. That's They're time. going out the door like it's going out of style. Uh -huh. Now they go out the door without the money. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's yeah, king. it's... Sorry, and the Fed's really limited in what it can do to fight inflation. It's ran out of bullets. Yeah. It's ran out of bullets. I would not want to be in their seat. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, can you give me the name of the person that decided to take $400,000 a year on you? <laughs> <laughs> Is this a real person? It's a whole bunch of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the but what legislature. is that's ours? Why huh? do they take that? Well, so what it is, is we uh, do not value our um, corporate properties, uh, any kind of infrastructure from uh, power companies to cable companies, railroads, that sort of thing, uh, here in Alamance County. That's done by the state of North Carolina so that it's consistent across all counties. And then when they turn over the information to us so that we can make bills, they go ahead and mark it down and say, here's what's left over. And But they do that per state law. And so they're not directly tapping it, but when I make a bill, that bill is just less than it would otherwise have been. And Jeremy, you, know, I, you can probably say this better than I can, but uh, you should tell the board what it's going to look like once we revalue. Once we revalue, mm -hmm. we're going to probably get. Correct me if I'm wrong. Between 120 and 160 million dollars added to our tax base. We're going to realize all this money that's going on in this in our community. We're going to realize exactly. that. That's why the public utilities are going to stay off our back. They say, hey, you go, all right, guys, you do what you're supposed to. You don't have to pay us 400 grand anymore. Because they got their money from the land that they own, from the corporation. So that is going to be huge. I mean, we're basically going to put money to our bottom line, to our take it to our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. We're going to put more on our balance sheet than our people give us in taxes. But aren't you sticking it to the citizens? No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. The, ma the, the citizens just realize the value of their property. Yeah, additionally, you're asking or potentially asking for more personnel mm -hmm. uh, in order to accelerate this process. $400,000 actually in excess of that sure. is a lot of money for salaries. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that we would save. Mm -hmm. So as Mr. Turner has pointed out, uh, we need to accelerate this if at all possible. Mm -hmm. If you can come back to us in December, right, December 20th, <laughs> on December 20th, we'd be very appreciative. Uh, Absolutely. Jeremy, would it be possible, I know we talked about this way back, mm -hmm. uh, would it be possible to maybe go out there and find out if there's some software that could help our citizens to this process? Because this is good. This is going to be just like a Oh, and it's actually going to be I'm worse, concerned. and it's going to be worse to a factor of 1.2. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it's going to be like, and that's what concerns me is it's not being able to put your finger on it because it makes everything down the road, mm -hmm. it's all skewed. Right. So it's really kind of hard. Right. So 
let's let's try to see if we can maybe see if there's somebody out there mm -hmm. who's already in this business to get, bring us some software that our our citizens could use in the comfort of their own home. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at stuff, making just that's just an idea. Well, and and speaking of uh, money well spent. Uh, so it's one of those things that uh, I think would be worthwhile. Um, the citizen side of the equation, um, there's some very good software out there that lets them check up, see what's going on, gives them a lot of information at their fingertips. And you know, speaking of Zillow, it has a very Zillow-esque look. You can see the neighborhood, see what's going on, but you can interface with tax data. You can roll over into uh, appeals, and it, it is pretty useful. Um, I value the citizen input, but I really value informed citizen input. And so by giving uh, extra tools out there so that they know exactly what we're dealing with, you weed out appeals that probably should never take place, and you allow those appeals that do go through to put their finger on what's what's happening. That's very advantageous. So th there is some software out there. Is it, it has to be. Just, it has to be. A little bit of expensive oh. in, in a sense of looking yeah. at the price tag but you know look at that price tag you always have to equate it like what what am i buying with right. this price tag what's it going to get me? right does it going to help my and you know i've been looking at some software sure. uh, and um there's some out there yeah. it's got price tags on it yeah. but the things that it handles mm -hmm. um next four hundred thousand dollars look like yeah. chicken feed no well, because it's it definitely it definitely sure. will fall underneath that i'm yeah. certain there is uh, really opening up now a market of trying to connect local governments with citizens. And so, you know, 10 years ago, if we talked about software, it would be the main tax software we're using. It's all very internal focused. But I, I think that folks have become aware that the government's connecting with the citizens and communicating well, very important. So a lot of that's come down the pipeline. And it's one of those. Uh, want but don't have to have on a regular year. We've got to have our internal software to function. Uh, the other is nice, but I will tell you, if, if we're going to see a very strong response, nice might be yeah. more than nice at this point. And what it looks like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this software looks like you, uh, you, you buy it and you pay in a monthly mm -hmm. fee yeah. along. Yeah. Okay. I think when you're on the road, he needs to go with you. <laughs> no, he's, he's smart. smart man. Boys, he's smart. Man. Man. Man, you don't want to be seen with the tax man. But I must admit, <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to this rebound. I've never done it before. I mean, I watched my dad do it, you know, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, but I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. But now I have the tools, and now I know exactly what you're doing and what the goal is. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited to do it. As a matter of fact, I may join the tax department. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you deal with numbers all day, every day, right? Mm, good. <laughs> 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 You know, I was, I, was, uh, I was told when I came to the department 15 years ago, uh, I said, tax department is like a fire. You can get close and it'll get you warm. You get too close, it'll burn you. <laughs> I like that. Tell that to a toddler. Uh -huh. I like that. Uh -huh. We're doing a great job, Jeremy. Thank you, thank so, you so much, much. for much. all your work that you do. And we, we thank you. It. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. I've been reminded, um, and I'm not going to say it was either the gentleman to my right, but uh, there's a potential filing that can occur at 12 noon today. <laughs> so we're going to accelerate things if at all possible. So <laughs> what, you got somebody going to sign up? <laughs> oh, we might. <laughs> okay. A couple of things. Couple of things. Uh, <laughs> Miss Day. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will be brief. I am before you for um, a budget amendment. Uh, DSS received $90,000 from DHHS for stimulus payments to our youth. Um, we were able to serve 26 youth with this money and their stimulus uh, check for our youth who were, well, they're actually young adults, I always call them youth, um, were under 21 years old. They received $2,500 and those above um, 21 years old received 5,000. So there's no county match, just wanna be able to um, put this money back into our budget. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Look at that's what hey. red looks like. <laughs> 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 I'm not 
saying nothing. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank I'm, you. I'm not talking about COVID. This is great. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. So before you is a request to reapply and budget uh, two hundred thirty-two thousand nine hundred twenty-nine dollars over three years for a healthy beginnings grant. This is a grant that we've been doing since 2016 and. The aim of this grant is to make sure we have good, good birth outcomes for mom that are, uh, moms that are uh, pregnant and, of course, um, provide them with postpartum care. And there is no county match and no out-of-state travel for this grant. So moved. Second. I have one question. Yes, sir. Um, this is a three-year grant. Correct. Mm -hmm. What happens after three years? Um, so, again, we've been doing this for 2016, since 2016, so hopefully we'll have the opportunity to reapply if they have the opportunity again but we use a part-time contracted part-time position for so for that and then really the other part of that money that's being used is uh, for program supplies so basically you would apply for a new grant and if granted the cost would still be hopefully zero to the county if on the other hand it's not it would be either drop the program or the county fund it Correct. If we wanted to continue the pro the program, right. what would that cost be? Seventy-seven thousand. Yeah, around around seventy, around eighty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make your money aware of that. Okay. okay. We have a motion. Second. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. And the next one before you is a budget amendment. Um, we received an extra, an additional ten thousand dollars from our. Uh, Community linkages to care grant, and that ten thousand uh, dollars will be used for harm reduction supplies um, to be able to provide for our partners. There is no uh, local match for the additional ten thousand dollars. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying hi. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And we appreciate the brevity. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, again, I assume no public speakers, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, so we'll um, skip over commissioner's responses. Uh, county attorney. Nothing. Excellent. That is really brief. We appreciate it. <laughs> An attorney to be that brief. Uh, county manager. Just please note, commissioners, December 8th, VIA has sent an email, I think, to the entire board. They're having an uh, online meeting. That is the meeting of their big 31 regional board. That is the big board, not our region That's four. Not us. That, absolutely. But all commissioners and uh, staff, I forwarded that to Adrian and Tony also. So you're welcome to log in and join it, but you'll be watching the, the overall governing board of VIA do its thing uh, on December 8th. But check your emails if you need it, let us know. Second point I want to touch and quickly. And what time is that? Is that uh, it is in the morning. I don't remember that time. I think I think the commissioners all got it. I think I saw your yeah. names, but if you yeah. did not and you want to participate, let us know. We'll forward you the link. Okay. I think it was morning at that time, but it would be good to sit in if you can. Um, uh, second uh, point, Andrews informed me that our final guidance was sent by Treasury uh, to the White House on November 13th for review. White House has not commented on that yet, but we hope we are getting very close to getting the very final version of our guidance. If we hear we have it, we will share it with you immediately. Excellent. Uh, last point, uh, we've I've reached out to the commissioner about the possibility of a work session this Friday, December the 10th at 9.30 a.m. To, to cover a couple of items that tend to be difficult to go through in a, in a regularly scheduled meeting. We've heard back that all commissioners are available this Friday, 9.30 a.m. Uh, we'll be looking at one of two locations, either in this space or the potential, uh, potentially over at the Ag Building. So uh, we'll be in touch with you very soon about where that will be located, and then we will properly notice that too for the paper and the public. So uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the one, PM. one PM for the for the via. Thank you. Big meeting. Are we turned in to the via people for the little meeting? Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. We don't, do we have a date? We don't. We, we don't. We haven't heard yet of a date for the uh, regional meeting, but that, I think that will be coming up after the first of the year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Thompson and I both are on that, that board. Uh, we would encourage it to be uh, close to Alamance County. That would be great, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be encouraged by it to, to plan those meetings here. It would be wonderful to do it here in Alamance County. And I think myself and Tony and Adrian will be uh, attending that, too, because we're all very interested in VIA and what they've got going on. So. Awesome. 
Any board member have a question, particularly about the work session Friday? Mm -hmm. uh, just nine, nine starts at 9.30. Right. Yes. I'll, try, I'll try to be here. On that. An, just a question, because I don't know the answer. I know the county gets ARP money, and I know the municipalities do too. We seem to be the only person that's had the forum for people to come in and tell us what needs they have and how we could possibly help them. A lot of these folks were Burlington, East Burlington, as a matter of fact. I'm just curious as to why the city of Burlington has not done something like that for that section of town that everybody that runs for office is always saying how they want to build that part up. That's a strong part of this community. Businesses, since I was a kid, are still there. But I'm just curious as to why is it the county? Why are we the only fairy godmother here? Well, I, I, I would laud the commissioners in that the, the public input is not required, and the commissioners have opted to do that. We've had our public meeting, and yeah. I think you should be commended for doing that. That adds time and effort to the process, but uh, you've done that. You've heard from uh, North and East Burlington residents. So if the commissioners decide that uh, you feel it led to spend money, uh, our money in those areas, there, there's no doubt we would have to work with the city of Burlington. So okay. uh, I think hear. Burlington would have to come to the table. We'd probably be working with our community development department and planning departments. Uh, and there would, I would imagine, be additional uh, discussions with the citizens of those areas if we're going to spend our money there. Well, there was some strong representation that yes, I want indeed. to see supported. And I just think it's a whole county-wide thing, not just one entity that does that. If, it, if it's any consolation, I, uh, I spoke to, to the uh, city council, new ones, Thank and the you. mayor about that. About let's see what you got because we could partner with these folks. Absolutely. Burlington Absolutely. and the county could come together. We could use some of our money, some of our money. so our money goes further, yeah. spreads yes. out further. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Dina. Uh, the only question I have for Miss Evans. And I'm going to have this question for you pretty much every meeting until we get a final answer. Where's the audit? Now that the um, mm -hmm. That's why I asked. has gone to yeah. the White House, we are still waiting on final ballot. Okay. Great. So. Is the 10000 for capital improvement included in that last revision? Or do you know? You're speaking of the ten million. A uh, ten million. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, thank you. I am not sure, but I believe I don't the think flexibility so. bill is still uh, has not. There's been no action on it. Uh, at the school of government office hours last week, they were encouraging uh, municipalities and local governments to reach out to their representatives. There are three North Carolina representatives who have expressed support for that flexibility bill. But there are others that uh, may be also influential if anyone wanted to reach out to them. So at this point, they don't know when action may happen. I would just like to say that I would like these commissioners to not let Jackie Fortner retire. No, it's not, <laughs> no not available. I think we should just. We you you want to make a resolution on that? Yeah, for a motion for a resolution on that. <laughs> Can I second that motion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, Jackie. What did you say? That's what he suffered enough. Uh. <laughs> you know? Never. He's earned his retirement. Yes, he has. Uh, Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other uh, commissioner comments? No. All right. Second. A motion, second. All in favor saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. 
Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.